Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the parallel session of Charter Day hosted by Emergency Medicine, specifically by the Irish Association for Emergency Medicine. My name is Fergal Hickey. I'm a consultant in Emergency Medicine in Sligo and currently am president of the Irish Association for Emergency Medicine. Perhaps unusually for a Charter Day session, we do not propose to have a series of lectures, but instead we are deciding to concentrate on podcasting, the skill of podcasting and hosting a live debate discussion uh, using the podcasting forum. We're very lucky to have with us uh, two people who have been responsible for the case report. The case report is a emergency medicine trainee led podcasting facility, which has been supported by the Irish Association for Emergency Medicine, but has a reach way beyond Ireland and way beyond Irish emergency medicine. And we're lucky to have with us the two instigators, Mo Hamza and Orla Kelly, both of whom are SPRs in emergency medicine. Now, you will be able to contribute to this session by using the Q&A function, which is on the right-hand side of your screen as you, as you look at it. So if you have questions that you want to ask, then please put the questions in the Q&A. And at, at various stages, I will intervene, uh, I will act as moderator and intervene and put those to the panelists, both obviously the people who are going to talk to you about podcasting, but later on uh, during, during and after the debate. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Mo Hamza. Thanks very much, Fergal, and um, thanks to RCSI and to IEM for giving us this uh, fantastic opportunity. Um, really looking forward to the panel discussion. But just before we dive into that, um, we're going to share, I suppose, a little bit about our journey on the case dot report, and I suppose where you can get started if you're hoping to get into podcasting. So here we go. The Case Dot Report is a trainee-led emergency medicine podcast. We release monthly episodes on different aspects of the specialty, each time centered on a clinical case and the acute management of the specific patient and presentation. Since our first episode in May 2020, we've had about 20,000 listeners worldwide. That still blows my mind, to be honest. Do you ever get so into a podcast that you're looking for excuses to put it on? There's a strong likelihood that you do. Listenership is on the rise globally and nowhere more than in Ireland. But why is that? Why do they get so addictive? A podcast is a great way of engaging people and giving them a sense of connection. Despite it being a recording, essentially a one-way communication, it's generally regarded as an intimate medium, bringing the audience closer to the creators and the subject than would be possible through more traditional or even more interactive media. The best podcasts I find are the ones that make you feel like you're in the room, that you're part of the conversation. It's no surprise then that listeners tend to engage with the content and creators a lot. And that's honestly one of the best things about what we do. And that formula is no different when it comes to medical podcasts. There are so many great ones, particularly in emergency medicine. Like, we're walking a path that is very well trodden. And the evidence is well established to support these as great learning tools, not just in terms of knowledge acquisition, but also learner engagement, which, to be honest, knowing what we know about educational research, I think it's more predictive of how good a learning modality is anyways. I don't think we'd do anything differently if we were to go back and start over, but we've definitely learned a lot on the way to where we are. There have been a lot of refinements on the way to the product and most importantly to the process. So what does that look like now? Well, I always say emergency medicine is a team sport, and this is reflected in how this podcast gets made every month. 
We have a phenomenal team that is spread out over the length and breadth of the country, and we bring them all together to collaborate on Discord. All our planning and coordination happens here. You can use Slack, Trello, Teams, but if you have a project like this with lots of people involved, an organized communication and collaboration platform is key. And most of these are free, which is great. In our server, for example, the team working on a specific episode would discuss plans in the thread for that episode, where there will also be a link to their Google Doc for scripting out the case and a Jamboard sometimes for storyboarding the episode. Once the ideas are fully cooked, we get recording. We'll talk about equipment in a bit, but the recording itself is done either online, if we're remote, or in person if possible, with the great gear we got thanks to IAM support. Most of our recordings have been online through the pandemic and we used Zencaster, which again, has a free tier. Next, that audio we just recorded almost always needs to be edited. Whether it's just fixing the levels or doing an in-depth cleanup of background noise and the innumerable snafus and bloopers, this can be an extremely time-consuming process. Depending on the level of production you're aiming for and the time you can afford to give this, having an external editor might be a worthwhile investment. And one, again, we were able to make this season thanks to IEM support. After that, you need to think about artwork for the episode, social media promotion, the web page design and show notes if you have a website. So what we're doing is definitely not a one-man job. That all seems like a lot, but you can do this. Bear in mind that you don't have to do all that we're doing. We set out with a very specific format and production quality in mind, and I'm really proud of the work that we're putting out each month now. But there are podcasts that I listen to that are essentially just a live recording of a conversation. The content is the most relevant thing to your listener. That's the most important tip I can give you. So there's your first step. Figure out your USP, your unique selling point, and the rest will fall into place fairly handy after that. Second most important to note, that while a decent microphone is a good idea, the law of diminishing returns sets in a lot sooner than you think. We did a test recording back when we were just starting off using inline mics on headphones, um, built-in mics on laptops, and some USB mics at varying price points. That showed us that a dedicated mic is a really good investment, but you don't have to spend much. Most of us still record with the 39 euro USB microphones we got on day one, and I would challenge anyone to pick out who has the pricier mics in any of our recordings. Another tip is to reach out to someone who's done this before. I was really lucky to be able to pick Andy Neal and Keen McDermott's brains um, before recording Word One, and that was an immeasurable help. I'd only be delighted to be that person for you, so feel free to get in touch. Lastly, I'd just like to thank the Irish Association for Emergency Medicine for their unwavering support over the last two years. They've shown us great faith and a lot of the refinements I mentioned and the growth we've enjoyed is down to the generous funding we received. So thank you. All right. I think that's enough out of me anyways. Um, it's time we head over for our first ever live podcast. Let's get to it. This is the case dot report. Okay. All right. Um, so welcome to uh, welcome to our first live podcast on the Case Dot Report um, with uh, IAM. So um, joining me is my uh, uh, co-editor on the Case Dot Report and um, co-chair for this uh, panel, uh, Orla Kelly. So say hi, Orla. Hi everyone, and hi Mo. Looking forward to getting start stuck into this discussion. 
absolutely yeah brilliant so i think we'll go around the uh the panel and get everyone to say hello and introduce themselves um so we might start with you connor greetings from uh atls in cork um and thanks for the last minute invite to this uh and i hope i can make a meaningful contribution but forgive me uh, that i haven't had the preparation i would usually uh, have in advance of of a really auspicious uh, Charter Day and well done to you Mo and to you Orla and it's a, it's a really exciting podcast that you guys got going and it's a great platform for us to talk about trauma and particularly about education and training in trauma and thanks for this opportunity. Perfect. Um, Ms. Susan Young. Hi, I'm Susan Young and Consultant General Surgeon um, and lead for major trauma in the Royal and Belfast. And I'd also like to thank you very much for the invitation um, to be here today. Um, Niall. Uh, hi again, Mo. Uh, Niall Buckley. I'm the Office Commanding Number 3 Operations Wing of the Irish Air Corps. That's the helicopter unit of the Air Corps. I've worked with uh, your colleagues a lot over the last 25 years, so really looking forward to the discussion today. Perfect. Uh, Mr. Sinnott. I'm O, I'm Keith Sinnott. I feel like the odd one out here. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, not an emergency medicine doctor. Um, I work in the matter and I'm the national clinic lead for trauma. And um, I'm a podcast listener, so I was interested in your introduction. Um, I wonder, will orthopedics ever follow you in trying to do this? It'll be interesting to see, can we do it? Um, but I'm really interested in your, your what you've said about communicating, because that's one of the challenges that I hadn't expected to be so big about trying to introduce a trauma system is how to communicate amongst ourselves and also kind of in a more wide fashion to the, the general population about what we're trying to do. So again, hopefully we can uh, help you with this. Brilliant. And uh, Dr. Quinn. Hi, um, I'm Nula Quinn. I'm a consultant in paediatric emergency medicine in Temple Street. I'm also the paediatric lead um, for the trauma system and working with Keith Sinnott um, to fully integrate paediatrics into the, the trauma system for Ireland. And um, Mo, in, uh, echoing everyone else's sentiment, I'd like to congratulate you on this. It's, it's great to see progressive technology being used and start to move emergency medicine forward. So well done. That's brilliant. And um, thank you all for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. And like I was saying earlier, it's um, it's going to be a fascinating discussion. There is absolutely no lack of um, expertise on this panel. So we might get started um, with you on the first question, Dr. Quinn. Um, so just across all the disciplines involved in trauma care delivery, there's a suite of procedural skills to learn and practice, and they're different across the different specialties. How do we identify these um, in each specialty and how do we create a consistency in their delivery um, and the training required for their delivery? Um, oh, sorry, I'm getting pop-ups here. <laughs> the HSE computers love pop-ups. Um, standardizing paediatric trauma teams, I think, across Ireland is, is going to be the way forward. Um, and certainly one of the things that we have been thinking about and what we've been doing is um, and hope to do is develop a national training package. Now, in the knowledge that staffing levels are completely different in different hospitals across Ireland, and they will be different with the new children's hospital, um, I think that the first place to start is with the trauma teams. Now, what we did in the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne is we started to change our trauma team over the four years that I was there. So um, I went over there to do a fellowship in paediatric emergency medicine, and then I was lucky enough to um, be the trauma fellow in RCH for a year. And we were trying to standardise things across um, the, the trauma delivery system. One of the things that we did with the trauma teams um, was that we changed and we tinkered a little bit with how the trauma teams were set out. Um, and it worked really well. So for example, um, we had an assessment doctor and their role was to perform the primary survey and identify the life threats, communicate them back to the team. And then we allocated a procedure doctor. So the procedure doctor would do things like the rapid infusion catheter, thoracostomy, chest drains. Um, and we brought that to Temple Street. Now, this trauma team is, is slightly different. Um, and I think that it worked well in that directly from the beginning, it allowed our clinicians to prepare but it also allowed us to kind of to think about the language that we use and make it a little bit more direct. So say, for example, the assessment doctor, um, are, you, are you competent and able to perform a primary survey and feedback any life threats? And um, with the procedure doctor, you'd be asking questions. So rather than things like, 
Are you, inverted commas, happy to put in a chest strain? So are you able and competent to perform a thoracostomy and insert a chest strain? And certainly from my point of view, in, in, in both of those hospitals, in Temple Street and in RCH, we've had incidents where we've asked questions like, are you happy? And, you know, in front of the team, the clinician has nodded. Um, and then we've had adverse incidents, um, particularly with, with chest strains. Um, so I think it's really important that we start thinking about our language. Now, I know that Ireland is different in the big hospitals in RCH, so it worked really well. Um, there were a huge amount of physicians, so it became less personal, if that makes sense. Um, I'm not sure how that would work um, in Ireland. I mean, definitely for the new children's hospital, we know that the staffing numbers are going to be um, are going to be much huger. Um, so we know that that probably that element of personalization will be taken away and that might not work in the smaller hospitals. Um, but definitely teams, but during the procedures, as you asked, um, it's, it's via um, a package of trauma team training. Now, again, that's something that we developed in the Royal Children's Hospital, um, and we've actually brought it into Temple Street. So we ran trauma team training days. Um, we got in all the specialties, because it's really, really important that you try and get buy-in um, from all the specialties, particularly from general surgery, who I suppose, not notoriously, but would be, you know, sort of not as engaged in, in, in trauma education um, as, as maybe they should be. Um, with the Trauma Team Training Day, what we did was we ran a series of lectures and then we did a high fidelity simulation and then we did um, uh, procedural skills. So we brought in animal models. Um, and in order to get buy-in from other specialties, um, we got different specialties to, in, uh, to to, to do the teaching. So say, for example, because I think it's really, really important that the that the other specialties of NCHDs and of consultant colleagues, I think it's really important that they see emergency medicine physicians actually performing trauma procedures and teaching other disciplines. So say, for example, on our um, trauma team training day, what we did was we got an emergency physician to perform and explain the thoracostomy and then a chest strain insertion. And then we brought in a consultant surgeon to um, to help suture it in and how to secure it properly and perform nice sutures. So I suppose from the point of view in, in the summary or to bring that all together, standardizing procedures um, can be done with um, standardizing trauma teams across the country with maybe thinking about how we provide um, trauma teams and the roles that we can do and with providing um, robust education packages that are not just used in, in one hospital but brought out eventually to um, the rest of Ireland via a, a trauma team training package mm -hmm. and finally making sure that emergency medicine physicians are, are seen performing and teaching other disciplines so that we're not handing over inverted commas complex procedures to other specialties um, and that we're, we're seen to be forefront and leading from from that point of view so sorry that was a bit of a, a long-winded answer um but but you know that that's how a I comprehensive feel. answer i'd say yeah and i and i think it's interesting nula because you're obviously coming from a pediatric perspective yeah. um you know we're we you know in the like when it comes to adults we would absolutely um be familiar with the emergency doctors placing chest strains uh the emergency medicine the, the the emergency doctors doing various procedures um they're taught it on the atls course uh and they're taught it subsequently in various induction programs and there's sort of this expectation whereas in children uh it's technically that little bit more difficult and i think there is this deference towards the specialties when it comes to procedures that doesn't exist in um, in the, in the adult world as much. Uh, sorry for interjecting there, Mo, but no, I just wanted to, to sort of the... yeah. I think Mr. Snow no, wants to come in on that as well. I just I suppose a slightly different perspective. Um, Nula made the point of the emergency meds and doctors interfacing vis-a-vis -vis procedures with the kind of the, the specialists. An example in my world is often where the orthopedic registrar gets asked to come down to reduce the shoulder because the emergency medicine registrar wasn't able to. Um, and you'll probably find the emergency medicine doctor has done a gazillion more than the orthopedic doctor. The orthopedic can do it when you've got a general anesthetic and muscle relaxant. So it's, um, you know, I think it's important to remember that, that very often what's happening in the emergency room is done much more by the emergency room doctors and in that environment. Uh, the specialists are used to doing it in theatre with an anaesthetist holding their hand and looking after everything else. So it's a very good point to be made to, you know, the, the, the specialists aren't always as specialist at doing those procedures in that environment as you might think. I think the point Nuller makes about 
there being standards set, and I, uh, that's an important point. So, for example, we know from the National Office for Clinical Audit, Major Trauma Audit, that we're very poor at, number one, pre-alerting the resuscitation room and capturing that pre-alert from pre-hospital, and number two, then, um, having a trauma team present for the arrival of that patient. Now, in reality, I suspect we're a lot better than what the Major Trauma Audit tells us we are, and that Part of the problem is that we're not writing down when we kick the tires as consultants and so on. But um, so there's a documentation piece, but there is no doubt that we need to define what a trauma team is. And then we need to audit the degree to which we comply to that trauma team activation. And um, the IAM has a position paper on a two-tier trauma team response, which I'm signposting the listeners to, uh, but I think that probably needs wider endorsement. And I think we in the National Office for Trauma Services uh, can work towards having that uh, trauma team document discussed with other specialties that are part of the trauma team to make sure that they're on board and that maybe we might issue um, sort of a, an umbrella trauma team document that would allow us then audit trauma team response, trauma team presence, who does what in the trauma reception and yep. resuscitation phase, yeah. uh, and then feed back that so that it feeds an education agenda. Yeah, I might just come to you um, before we move on from this question, um, uh, Ms. Young, um, just for a general surgical perspective on that. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with uh, Nula. Um, on my fellowship, we had real issues with um, getting engagement from the general surgeons. You know, it was kind of like, why do I have to go down to this trauma call? It's taking me away from theatre. Um, but, you know, for, for me as a, you know, a general surgeon being involved in a trauma resuscitation, I find it so much easier being there from the start of the resuscitation. You can see what's going on. You see how the patients responded to um, various interventions, such as, you know, major hemorrhage protocol or whatever, as opposed to just, you know, arriving down maybe 25 minutes into the action um, and being told this patient needs a laparotomy. It's just so much better if we're there from the start and involved in teaching and training. Um, and it's just really important that we foster that attitude that, you know, it is important for us as um, general surgeons to be there and um, you know we, I can see a change in mindset already and um, from the opening of our major trauma centre and the trainees and um, you know we've got interest from them they want to come along they want to see what's going on and being involved so it's really just really important to foster that culture um, of engagement and being involved. I think that um, I think that follows on actually quite nicely in, into the next question in that I suppose that there's not always um, a culture of engagement and, and sometimes there could be conflict as well. Um, um, perhaps when there's not clear delineation of trauma teams and the members and it's, it's well known that conflict can dull our clinical decision making abilities. Um, so, you know, I mean, do people have ideas on how we can break down these kind of silos and, and you know, and get learn to play nice together, I suppose. And uh, Niall, I might put that question to you firstly. Yeah, I'm not sure that everyone agrees that I play nicely all the time there, Orla. Um, I suppose from the military and aviation perspective, there has been a kind of a long understanding that communication and dealing with people in confined areas as cockpits are requires um, certain skills. So over the years they developed, and I'm, I know that the medical world has something similar, crew resource management in terms of conflict management and conflict resolution. And CRM, you know, has a couple of key principles, communication, decision-making, situation awareness, workload management, um, and leadership as was a big part of uh, dealing with silos uh, are, understanding and managing our own biases, um, particularly uh, if you are an experienced person dealing with somebody that's quite inexperienced and understanding and respecting what they're saying um, and listening to what they're saying, as well as being an active listener. Um, and it's, it's more than, it's, it's also, I suppose, is to allow a pause between the communication space so that people can say and speak freely. And what as aviation, it kind of jumps into some of your uh, uh, I suppose other areas in terms of uh, simulation, but we put a lot of time and effort into uh, developing CRM and and teaching people or facilitating people and how to work in an open environment. So you might be a really really experienced pilot working in a high pressure area. You might have a very inexperienced co-pilot, co um, but it's imperative that you know that that skipper that she listens to the junior co-pilot in any given scenario and and respects what she's hearing. Um, and it, there are, I suppose, there, of course, there are scenarios where if you're the 
senior consultant or you're you're the clinician in charge you have to make decisions that are you know they're time critical and a decision has to be made and it's there's so there is sometimes a bit of misconception that crm and aviation allows everyone to sit around and chat about things that wouldn't be it but it allows i suppose um a standing operating procedure for a time and a space for everyone to have their say to have so that their say is equal in terms of how it's given and how it's listened to and then the decision is made and, and you kind of move on from it so i suppose in terms of trying to avoid the development silos i think having those principles in place that those operating procedures so be it the senior clinician and the most junior intern in the room if they've got something to add that they're listened to and they're heard and i suppose that they're respected that'd be that'd be the thing that i'd have learned over the years that you respect people from uh, all grounds um, and all experience profiles. And I think the other part maybe that we don't suffer from as much um, is that the cultural difference and those of us that have served overseas would have noticed that, you know, dealing with people with different cultures and different backgrounds. As a Corkman like Connor here on the call, you know, if you're at home and you say, I will, yeah, in Cork, that means no. But if you're somewhere in uh, West Africa or you're in Australia or North America, you say, I will, yeah, it means I will. Um, and my wife is particularly good at saying that, by the way. Uh, so there, there are there are uh, nuances that exist in certain parts of the world that don't exist here, and then likewise. So I think communication, understanding your culture, and then having those um, handrails, those standing operating procedures, are what my, I would have experienced would, are quite good at uh, lowering silos. Silos will, will exist in my experience, um, but it's about lowering them and, and making them, I suppose, weaker. I mean, of, all, of all the cultures that are um, that are present and, and nationalities in, in Irish healthcare, um, it was definitely important to point out the the Corkman's uh, individual language. Um, Mr. Sinnett, do you want to pop in on that? <laughs> not necessarily the Corkman's language, but the the question at large. I will. I certainly will not be putting on a Cork accent. That's for sure. Um, it was interesting to to hear Niall talking about silos and your question mentioning silos and, and communication and stuff. And um, those of you who've worked in the matter and perhaps elsewhere know that we use this app called Silo. Now I'm I was interested in Mo's introduction to podcasting. I am a dinosaur and all of these things are new. And when the SHOs told me about WhatsApp, I wondered what the hell I wanted another uh, texting machine to do. But understanding how kind of vertical and horizontal communication worked and how it could work in teams is kind of useful. And one of the things that I've noticed the way we use this in the matter, and effectively it's it's WhatsApp for referrals and for communicating, is that it expands the silo and maybe a difference between what Niall has, pre-resource management in an aircraft is, you know, within within the, the perspex and the aluminium of the aircraft, whereas for us it can be across the institution or across a whole healthcare system. And to foster that sense of communication that people can be can get to know each other and can communicate in a fashion that people, I notice that I am aware of the various people working in the emergency department in the matter, even though they often change every six months because I see their names on silo and there's a bit of a knowledge to it. And I think that helps with communication. It helps bringing people together. And then another interesting thing, again, that, that kind of Niall mentioned was the, the more senior and the more junior person. I had an interesting conversation with a consultant colleague of mine once about um, an artificial barrier that had been placed and the rationale apparently was, and, and I quote from the consultant colleague, it's to stop an SHO ringing me at three o'clock in the morning. Um, and my response, now maybe I was just grandstanding because I was itching for a row, was, you know, if an SHO rings me at three, three o'clock in the morning, that tells me automatically there's something bad going on. And the last thing I'm going to do is give out. So it's a good point that Niall makes that if, if you're in a position of seniority, you should listen more, not less to the junior people, because if they're putting their hand up, it's probably important and you need to foster that kind of element of human communication. Yeah, it's a great point, and I think all of us, um, all of us NCHDs would, would love um, uh, would love that to be the pervasive thought of, amongst consultants. And I think in in emergency medicine, and, and uh, Connor and Nilly might be able to come in on this. Um, it's it's a it's a more it's a less hierarchical structure, um, and certainly we you know we we call our consultants um, quite frequently for for help with with complex cases like this. Um, Connor, do you want to jump in with that? Uh, just to say, like education, and obviously I'm in the thick of it right now, we, we've got our ATLS course going on in Cork, but bringing people together for ATLS courses, European trauma courses, uh, you know, the European trauma course is going to be the the, the, the trauma team leadership course in Ireland, and, and Keith and Tomás Breslin and Fran have worked very hard at establishing it in Ireland, and um, so we will be seeing more of that. And one of the things that 
Uh, certainly at the European trauma course that I noticed was how social it was. So, uh, so I got to sit down with an orthopedic surgeon from the Mater and with a plastic surgeon from Cork and an anaesthetist from Tullamore uh, for, as a candidate on this course. And we had great fun, you know, so we were sharing war stories, but there was, in order to have that fun, you have to have confidence in your own ability. And you can't be there as a shrinking violet, uh, really. You, you have to go there prepared, have read the stuff, have, you know, have, you know, prepared in advance so that you're going to feel confident going on the course in the first instance, albeit that you're going to learn and you're going to be on a learning trajectory during it. But uh, sometimes we sort of curl up into our own little insular ball when we go on these courses and we're frightened to engage in a meaningful way with our colleagues. But it's by that engagement and hearing the stories and the workarounds that they came up with that we really learn uh, so much. Uh, and then, you know, you have that colleague, you've got their phone number in your phone, you've got a relationship with them uh, and, and you've got a, friend, a friendship with them uh, whereby you can pick up the phone at you know, and say, Jesus, they're doing this in Cork. What way do you do this up at the matter? And and that sort of professional rapport and friendship, I think, is the it's the petrol that drives the engine. Um, yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, Keith, do you want to jump back in there? Yeah, sorry, just to follow up, and I'm sorry to hog things from what Connor said. I, I had kind of an, an interesting experience over the course of three or four weeks, where as I went, where I went from instructing on a European trauma course. And trying to teach people like Professor uh, DC about trauma team management, um, which was intimidating in its own right to being a candidate on an ATLS course with Fergal Hickey giving out shy to me and trying to fail me. Um, and actually, I learned a huge amount from both of them, um, exactly as Connor says, about how to interact with people. And it was probably more instructive being a candidate and trying to learn um, and learning from the other candidates. Uh, so it is really important, and as Connor said, it's to integrate and get involved and not to be afraid to be the, the, the learner or the teacher um, if you have the appropriate environment. So I said it was, it was an unusual juxtaposition of roles and courses over the course of a small two-week period. I was actually on that ATLS course. I thought you were a fantastic uh, co-candidate. Co um, yeah, I'm unlikely to be on an interview anytime soon. It's all right. You don't have to <laughs> yeah. right, yes. <laughs> um, We might go to Miss Young and then Niall, and then I think I, we might have some questions from uh, the group from Fergal. I was just going to say, um, I had the same experience recently on ATLS. Um, well, a while ago, I um, my ATLS instructor status expired before CCT, so I had to go right back to the start and be a candidate again after teaching it for years, and it was horrible. It was really eye opening, um, but I think it was a good experience. It gave me a real insight into how the candidates feel on doing the course, um, and just coming in on the conflict. Uh, sort of question there um you mentioned about the european trauma course um i think sort of that reflects in real life as well we're very lucky that we've got a a, a multidisciplinary major trauma rota um, and the royal you know including ed consultants uh, orthopedic surgeons neurosurgeons um, and general surgeons so you know just talking to the, um those guys in the tea room and whatever and being involved and getting to hear different insights and different point of views you know question why did you do that or you know not in a confrontational way but just in a generally curious way to learn you know why they do things that way and can we do you know improve things better in our way of working um, and again it's just building those relationships and having conversations with people no yeah it just sounded kind of the the trust piece and the unofficial communication networks that exist between professionals. I always uh, ref kind of think back on a, on a foreign colleague who told me you can't surge trust. You just can't turn it on when the emergency happens. The trust has to develop in advance of the of the, the crisis um, occurring. And I, that's where I think a lot of that unofficial engagement and on that training that happens on courses and you get people from disparate backgrounds working together. That's where a lot of that trust is developed and it's only ever utilized uh, and when the crisis happens or the event requires that trust, it might be months, weeks, or even years later. And just as was another piece on our own experience in the military, we don't act in our own individual silos. So you might be an aircraft commander going out on a flight, the weather might be poor, you might have complex decisions around uh, fuel management, etc. And we would always, and we have a, a, a tiered system. So in terms of authorization, you have 
after ring somebody of a more senior rank or experience profile prior to, to um, launching on, on a flight. And it's, it's was, that's a recognition too, that even though you might be very experienced, you might be uh, the most experienced commander in, in a particular aircraft type, you still have to ring somebody else and you have to justify your decisions uh, and you have to get authorization for a flight. So I suppose it's that kind of continual engagement externally to second, it's not to second guess ourselves, but it's always to kind of keep ourselves in check. Perfect. Thanks for that, Niall. Um, Fergal, what questions have we got from our audience? Yeah, well, we've, we've essentially two questions, one of which bears on the subject we're talking about now. And it's really about, you know, given the importance um, of human factor skills and its role in medicine, how can we incorporate human factor skills and non-technical skills into the emergency trauma situation, given the urgent nature of it? Now, Brian Flavin has partly addressed that, but I think it's important that the panel might consider it, and I suppose it bears on some of those discussions about trust and how do you have trust in advance. Perfect. Anyone want to come in on that? It's very okay. unusual for those group to be mute. I know, I know. Especially looking at DC there. It's very unusual um, to see him quiet. I'll just come in um, two seconds on that. I was, you, you know, listening to the the other panelists and about interdisciplinary relationships. And whenever I came back um, and I have my consultant interview um, for the PEM position post, um, one of the questions I got asked actually was about this. So I was coming back and I was uh, talking about, you know, bringing my experiences back um, from the from being a trauma fellow and um, how I was going to put my money where my mouth was and, you know, develop these teams. And, and they kind of pointed to, OK, you're saying that you're going to develop a team. You said that you're going to develop trauma team training. Um, notoriously, it can be difficult to bring people who um, who aren't interested with you, but in the knowledge that you need other specialists to come on, on board. So they said, how are you going to do that? So obviously, you know, when you're coming back to um, to another hospital and maybe you don't know that many people and you hear these names, the first thing I said was, OK, well, I would send them an email. I'd introduce myself if I didn't know them and ask if I could maybe meet them and get them to come on board. And then they said, OK, you, you send the email and they don't reply. Then what do you do? So I said, OK, well, maybe you could call up to their office and knock the door and again, introduce yourself and say what you're about and try to bring them on board. Then the interviewer kept going and he said, all right, you've emailed, no response. You've called up to the office and there's no one there. What do you do next? So I said, OK, well, maybe you could use an opportune moment if you're walking past them in the corridor. or You see them in the canteen or something to, you know, go up and um, introduce, again, introduce yourself and, you know, discuss your plans and see if you can bring them on board. And they said, OK. You don't see them in the corridor, say, for example, a general surgeon, because they're always operating in theatre. Then what could you do? And I suppose, you know, it's trying to make it a little bit um, personal and you could use opportunities like this is what I said. Well, if you're in the recess room and you spot somebody and they're difficult to get a hold of, just go up and say hi um, if the moment or if the scenario allows you to and um, try and get maybe a bit of banter going or relieve the pressure in the room and, and try and grab them that way. And like that question actually really, really stuck in my mind because it's a question that I had never, um, I, I would never have thought about preparing it, but it's actually a real life situation. And it's something that definitely, um, you know, will happen all of us in our daily lives and and part of being able to develop relationships and bring people on board. And um, yeah, it's just something that really um, struck me and it's something actually that I used whenever I came back to, to Temple Street. Uh, Ms. Young, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I think I would agree with that. Again, it's just getting back to um, maybe just getting a coffee in the theatre tea room or just bumping into somebody in the corridors going here, what did you think about that case the other week? Or, um, do you know, just informal chats rather. I totally agree with you about emails. It's just there's nothing worse than getting an email. Half of us, you know, I, well, I wouldn't say this in a forum but uh, we don't ignore our emails but we might you know miss a few going through 50 odd when we get back from leave or maybe 100 or whatever but just you know those informal conversations are so important and um, to form those relationships and just you know listening to people's opinions and you know and um, you know letting them hear your point of view as well so I think those informal opportunities are the are the most beneficial. 
Perfect. Um, just an in interest of time, Fergal, we might come back to the other uh, Q&A questions in a little while. Um, so just going to, that discussion there is brilliant and it takes us um, to a slightly wider focus then um, from those individuals in that recess um, who are now getting along great, uh, working very well together um, to kind of, a you know, the institution at large, I suppose. So we want our major trauma centers and our trauma units to be highly functioning uh, organizations but what goes into being a high performance organization um and i suppose if anyone wants to come in on that um we might start with you uh, mr sinnet sorry mo you couldn't repeat the question for me could you yeah, absolutely. So um, we're we're looking at our institutions at large now, and I suppose we want those institutions, whether they are major trauma centers um, like, like um, your institution in the matter or our trauma units to be, you know, high performing organizations. But what goes into that specifically? It's, it's very difficult and it comes back to what we spoke about at the start and let me talk about and the, the reason, as you said, for podcasting is communication is trying to persuade people first of all, of the utility of, of what we're trying to do. Um, and one of the challenges, particularly with trauma care, and again, lots of people have mentioned, is it's not a monospecialty event usually. Um, and you need buy-in from a big, broad range of specialties and of disciplines. Um, and trying to get people all in the, you know, sync the same hymn sheet is really difficult. Well, a course in management that I did once spoke about trying to organize things like this and said that it was important to have a, have a single goal that everybody could work towards so that all their different endeavors could be kind of focused in one way. Um, and you would think that's easy for us because generally speaking, kind of on an individual case, it's focusing on the particular patient and bringing the team together to optimize their outcome. And then on a broader case, we know that what we're trying to do in terms of reorganizing things affects a significant improvement. I often say that, you know, if I invented a drug that could give a 20% increase in survivorship for a cancer, I'd probably get a Nobel Prize. But trying to introduce a system to do the same thing for the disease that kills more people under the age of 50 than anything else brings me I'm not sure exactly what the opposite of a Nobel Prize is, but I, I have a good feeling what it is. And um, based on some of the uh, lack of congratulatory comments I tend to get, um, but it is a case of trying to communicate to people the benefits of what we're trying to do and then trying to get them on board. And it is really difficult. You have to kind of have individual examples. And if you get the opportunity to debrief after a difficult case to do it gen gen gently and bring people on bit by bit to try and encourage them, trying to broaden the focus. Um, you mentioned trauma teams and one of the things about the, the European trauma course without wishing to harp back on it I'm not, not trying to, I don't make any money if people do it or not but it is to bring people in into that space so I remember doing it for the first time in Anna Skillen and learning that even though you know I'm the last person you want to be intubating you or maybe well I, I, can, I open chests the odd time oddly enough so I can kind of do that I'm certainly not doing a laparotomy but standing at the head of the bed and trying to guide a trauma team and trying to utilize the skills of other people is a good opportunity to, to give that kind of perspective to people and try and bring them on board. But it is very difficult and it takes a very long time and you've got to overcome a lot of people who, who see change as challenging and who don't have the bigger, the broader perspective. Um, it, it's relevant in some cases that you get very, very specialized in a very kind of complex area, but it is very hard sometimes to lift your head up and see the kind of but what I might say is the bigger picture, but um, it's certainly not easy. Um, it's not easy in a place like the matter. Connor might give you an idea of what it's like in a place like Cork. I'm sure the cha same challenges exist anywhere. Um, maybe Nula might tell us how they do it in Australia. Perhaps the more direct kind of around a barbecue, a few tins of fosters might help, help but I don't know. Um, but um, it's, it's certainly not easy, but we do our best. Yeah, medical Razzies. It's a great idea for an event. We'll run it uh, alongside the healthcare awards. Um, Professor DC, do you want to come in on that next? Look, if, if this stuff was easy, we'd have done it ages ago. Uh, and, and it's not easy. And one of the challenges associated with trauma is that there are so many stakeholders. You've got, you know, you've got ourselves, you've got pre-hospital practitioners, you've got the person who takes the phone in NEOC, uh, you've, you've got, you know, you've got your suite of inpatient specialists and trauma is not their sole goal you know so when i talk to my general surgical colleagues at cuh their sole goal isn't to be excellent at trauma care delivery they're so you know oftentimes what they've spent their time on fellowship doing is cancer care uh, and so on and they have you know they have a very real uh, draw towards 
the area that they've studied most and that they have world-class expertise in. And then you bring trauma on them, which is all about chaos and all about undifferentiated injury uh, and putting manners on it. And it's, uh, it's not necessarily it, it, something that they're particularly delighted about. Um, but I think we do now at this stage have an opportunity to improve things where where there's a there's a movement, the ship is a sail, and, and we need to bring it to port. So at CUH, we've established uh, an executive implementation, major trauma center implementation committee, and that's chaired by the CEO. And the, you know, so that means our CEO, our accountable officer for trauma at CUH, is committed and has committed the institution to the government policy that is the implementation of trauma networks in Ireland. So trauma networks in Ireland are a government priority for the next seven years. And part of that is delivering the major trauma centre at the Matter and in Cork. And subsequent parts of it will be delivering the trauma units across the country and education within that trauma structure and so on. But it is vital that we have an executive commitment as far as I, uh, you know, in terms of my take on things, it's, ex it's vital that we have executive uh, commitment to it within the hospital. So on that executive CUH Major Trauma Centre Implementation Committee, we've got the CEO as, uh, as, the, as the chair, we've got the head of HR, the head of estates, the head of nursing, and so on. We've got all of the, 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 the top people in that organisation, in our organisation, who are set about creating a scaffold that allows us to deliver better trauma care. And from that, then we've got subgroups. So we've got reception and resuscitation, which is our part of it, which believe it or not, folks, probably only lasts for two hours. And then reconstruction and ongoing care, which lasts for weeks and rehabilitation and egress, which lasts for weeks, months, years. Uh, and so uh, we've set up those subgroups. Uh, as part of our implementation plan in, in terms of developing a major trauma centre. The other piece that I want to, and, and I'm so, sort of slightly going off point here, but I think it's really important that we acknowledge it, is the importance of the multidisciplinary team. And establishing that multidisciplinary team um, from the get-go in terms of it comprising HSCPs, uh, nursing, or uh, medics, and then within that medics umbrella, the various specialties that exist within medicine and of course there's huge tribalism which makes this very challenging and insofar as we can we need to try and you know blend with the other tribes uh, and that's not easy and one of the uh, one of the books that I've found helpful was Caldini uh, I'm not sure many of you might have heard it's, it's around a long time it's the elements of persuasion and it talks about there being six elements of persuasion reciprocity so people will do uh, will feel compelled to return favors that you do for them will feel compelled to be nice to you in return for you being nice to them and so on. And of course, it's very easy for us to get barbed and to get difficult and to get stroppy uh, when in fact, you know, once, once the bee stings, it dies and that, uh, and, and that can make subsequent engagement with these folks difficult. But there are, there are five others. So there's recipro reciprocity, commitment. When people make a decision, they feel compelled to stick with that decision. So getting them on that boat in the first instance is key. Uh, and we can sometimes hel help that happen through uh, education and the various courses that we've got going on or through engagement with major trauma audit uh, or through engagement with those subgroup um, uh, subgroups that I've mentioned. Authority, scarcity, consistency, and liking somebody. People will do things for people that they like. People won't do things for people that they don't like. And it boils down to these really normal human behaviors. And we need to think about how they influence the care that's delivered you know, by us and how our behaviors influence the care that's delivered to the patient at the, in, the end of the day. So Caldini, look out for it. If you haven't read it, it's worth it. Perfect. Uh, Mr. Hickey, um, give us a question from the uh, audience there before we move on well, to the next one. Yeah, it's certainly related to this issue. So the question really is about how can we involve the other specialties who are not engaging fully with the vision laid out uh, in the National Trauma Plan? That's one for Keith, unfortunately, I think. Yeah, if I had the answer to that. 
Uh, it, it, by the it, way, it, and by the way, he was actually very good on the HNS in Sligo, and we're looking forward to having him back. <laughs> um, it, it really is a case, I think, of, of trying to trying to use all the information that you have, trying to persuade people um, of the benefits of what's happening, trying to fit trauma in a strategic fashion within the framework of everything that's that's likely to be happening. Um, so sometimes people can see the benefits of being involved. It, it kind of it brings resources, it brings addition, additionality. Um, uh, oftentimes, we find ourselves resourcing people who will only intermittently be involved in trauma and have a, other kind of time to do, trying to, to get things involved. Um, to an element, and Connor mentioned the importance of having se senior um, administrators involved in trying to roll out these things, because sometimes it does take a, a bit of a stick as well as a carrot approach to get people involved. But, and again, it's been mentioned a few times before, the more you can talk to people and get them and get them close, um, the more likely you are to, uh, to, 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 you know, to do something with them. And things like the courses we've mentioned before are great ways to actually interact and socialize with people. I think we were all struck by how you're, you're meeting people who you'd communicated with because you'd read a report that they'd done on an x-ray or because you'd referred them a patient or something. But actually getting face-to-face -face or closer personal with somebody is kind of much easier. Um, it's, it's, we're all familiar, and I know Susan mentioned about emails, and sometimes we avoid them, not because we don't want to do the work, but because they're unpleasant and the reply is going to be unpleasant and you get yourself in this kind of whirlwind of, of, of rubbish. Whereas if you actually bumped into somebody, um, first of all, they're less likely to be unpleasant to you. And usually, although not always when you're an orthopedic surgeon, you're less likely to be unpleasant back again. Um, but it, it is very difficult because <clears throat> while specialties such as emergency medicine and orthopedics um, are very intimately involved in, in trauma care, for a lot of other specialties, it really is peripheral to their, their, their kind of main line of activity. Um, and a lot of time, while, while we may have chosen our specialties because we have an interest in trauma, you've got people who chose their specialties specifically because they didn't have an interest. So it really is difficult. And then you try and make their lives easier. So one of the things that Connor hosted a webinar or a, a meeting on it was the inpatient trauma team that, that when we were in Cork. And that's one of the models. So often and a lot of other specialties will find themselves looking after inpatients with traumatic injuries, which isn't their bread and butter, not what they're used to. And sometimes by unloading them and by asking them to just do what they're interested in and not do all the other bits that they're not interested in might be a way to kind of to, to, to buy yeah. by their engagement in the process. And um, but but unfortunately to a large degree it's time and patience. And again, that's something else that's not in in a you know found in abundance in, in the orthopedic world. But I'm trying to learn about it as time goes by. Brilliant. Uh, Ms. Young, you wanted to come in on that? Um, I suppose it's just um, about spreading the word. I think one of the things I have noticed is just, you know, you just need one or two people in each specialty um, to kind of buy into it. And then they'll spread the word that it's a good thing to their colleagues um, and hopefully just saying the same message over and over again. You kind of you have to be like a bit of a squeaking gate um, in trauma um, to get people to buy into it you know, spread, celebrate the successes. There's nothing better than consultants from different specialties coming together to look after a trauma patient, having those discussions, you know, in uh, the resource bay, just in the corridor before theatre, you know, things like, you know, us having conversations with the orthopedic surgeons, like, uh, do you want us to move the stoma a bit higher? So your x flex will not get in the way, all those little minute details. Um, and if the patient does well, if you see that patient succeed and get, get out of hospital, that just helps to, foster that sort of culture of you know success and that it is a good thing and um, that we're all trying to achieve brilliant and niall do you want to come in on that just on the generalities of high performance um companies or, or work environments there's loads of research out there there's a, a million mbas being done in them as we speak so and it, because obviously they're high performance and uh, work environments lead to high performance outcomes. Uh, but I think the, the commonality being a lot of them is, especially when you're bringing together um, disparate sections into into a common area or into a common building or structure, this is, you know, the research would be kind of strong that you communicate the intent very clearly, that you over communicate the intent, especially in medicine, you, you, you're all working with high performance colleagues, you're all there to, to help others anyway. And I suppose I, I don't mean to infantilize it in, in any way, but it's about communicating the reason that you're doing something. And and just to pick up on what Susan was saying, that the more you communicate, you will, it, it sometimes it can, it, it can appear that it's almost annoying to some, but it's to get the same message over and over and over again. It eventually seeps into the common narrative, which which helps. I won't say it fixes it, but it certainly helps on that uh, horrible word journey to where you're going to. 
We um we might change tack just uh just now and, and talk about something else that we certainly as emergency trainees are a big fan of, <clears throat> um, which is simulation. And um emergency medicine has has kind of em- embraced this um quite a bit and um there's been some fantastic initiatives in, in kind of in um university years with things like sim wars and things like that. But um what do people think is the role of, of simulation at this institutional level? And uh, Niall, I might go to you first, because uh, although in emergency medicine, I think we're really good at it. Aviation probably was, um, was really the, the, the people that uh, got it off the ground, as it were. Yeah, nice pun there, too, by the way, in fairness, Orla. That, that, you, that was completely off the cuff as well, I honestly. I, I know, <laughs> I, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> You've been working on it. It's, it, it um, yeah, I, look, I think, and, you know, I'd, I would like to hold aviation up as a, a paragon of virtue in every area either, because a lot of this came from, you know, horrendous mistakes over the years. And, and, and you know, aviation can't hide its mistakes because they're always very public. And that's for so a couple of reasons we've been driven to simulation. Uh, one is that you can simulate emergencies in simulators that you can't do in real aircraft. You can, you know, you can, if you're a twin engine aircraft, you can simulate uh, twin engine failure, you can simulate fires, you can ex- simulate the most extreme events. And also, of course, there was a, a, a huge commercial push because uh, simulator uh, times and simulator is, is less expensive, particularly for bigger aircraft. So in terms of what do we get out of it, we, uh, we, we send our uh, flight crews off to simulators every six months because it's seen as the aviation is seen as the perishable skill set. So it's every six months. It allows people to go out, assess themselves, work alongside colleagues. But also, I think what I personally got, what I got out of uh, simulation is seeing myself play back to myself. You know, hearing your voice, hearing how you interact, um, the things you say. Uh, I re- I only realise that I use my hands an awful lot when I communicate. Which, when you're wearing a headset inside an aluminium tube, travelling at 170 miles an hour, uh, you know that's not really very useful. It, it's about what, how you say it. How do, so at an institution level, um, yeah, so that, that's kind of very much at, the, at the, what we call a tactical level, but at the operational or strategic level in military terms, uh, we would use simulation or war gaming quite a lot. Um, and the, the, the reason for that is uh, one, it's, you know, it's obviously to bring people together and, and to test their skills, but two, it's, you know, there's an old uh, military phrase that planning is everything and plans are nothing. It's that during because you're in a simulation environment and because you're working with colleagues, you see your own weaknesses, you see maybe some of the uh, weaknesses of, I won't say colleagues, but um, systemic weaknesses. And it, that just, it opens your eyes to it. It's not a panacea, by the way. Um, I think there's, there's a point where simulation it can bring you to. Um, and in, in it, some of the stuff that's in aviation now is simply incredible. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, putting the person in the real aircraft, having to make the real decisions, there is a difference. Um, so we would, I'd be a huge supporter of simulation, but there is a point where uh, it's, you, you know, it kind of, it, it's the law of, as you were saying earlier on, Mo, about the uh, microphones, the law of diminishing returns. But I, I would be a huge supporter, but I think it's, it's something that every organization, if they can get their hands on it, be it scenario simulation or technical simulation, um, it's worth its weight in gold. Um, Dr. Quinn, do you find that you're um, utilizing it in, in pediatrics in terms of the kind of that high acuity, low frequency type scenarios? Um, or do you use it as, as you know, multi, multidisciplinary kind of um, up at, at higher levels? Um, so we actually, we do both. I mean, simulation is the way forward. And I, you know, honestly believe that it's emergency medicine that's leading it. It's really, really important that we get multidisciplinary by and almost to so say when we run our hospital wide sims if somebody like susan came down i mean that the value of that would be absolutely you know unbelievable what we've done in temple street is we've organized and i think this works really well like a hospital wide sim um, and we planned it with other specialties and um, so say for example um i would email them maybe two months in advance and say you know what what days are best for you we're going to do a hospital wide sim and then we would say, OK, so say on Tuesday the 28th, we're going to have a hospital wide sim. We contact Switch. We tell them that we're going to put out a trauma pager. Um, the other specialties will free up a doctor um, to, to, um, to be free on that day to come to the sim. And then we put out, as I said, a trauma call and everybody comes down and we do high fidelity simulation with every member of the trauma team um, and using animal models and high fidelity models. Um, like I've said before, I feel that it's really important that other specialties see emergency medicine performing and teaching other disciplines. And I think that simulation is a, a really, really good way of doing that. Um, we have our local sim 
within the ED that we do every week, but the hospital-wide sims are, are really where we can um, build on our performance and use our trauma team to improve communication and, um, and procedures as well. Um, with simulation, I mean, we have mostly low fidelity models and we bring in like animal parts. So say, for example, we'll bring in a, a sheep, you know, authorities and, and stick them into the axilla um, of low fidelity um, mannequins. But I think with simulation investment um, going forward is, is really where it's at. Um, so the plan for the new children's hospital is that we have a sim committee and I sit on that committee um, and that suite will be developed. And I know that probably the major trauma centres in Cork and the matter will be doing the same. We get um, all of the specialties to come on board and we ask them to develop their scenarios. So each specialty will write up their own. And then, as I said, investment in these high fidelity models and in the sim lab, I think going forward, that, that that's going to really improve the delivery of simulation and um, patient care. Um, fantastic. And, and Miss Young, do you find that um, simulation is used in, in surgery um, in its discipline alone? Um, and I suppose follow on, are you involved in multidisciplinary sims and, and do you find them beneficial? Yeah, so I would agree with uh, Nula. Emergency medicine definitely are leading the way, anaesthetics as well, in terms of simulation. Um, my sim experience as a general surgical trainee was basically a box and a couple of um, sort of old instruments acquired from theatre and we, we kind of trained ourselves laparoscopically, which is less than ideal. Um, obviously it's getting much better now, but we're definitely lagging behind still. Um, so in terms of uh, my sim experience, I've really had my eyes open since I've become involved in major trauma. Um, like Niall was saying there, um, the first kind of real experience I had um, in trauma um, and simulation was a trauma team leader course um, in Liverpool. Um, and basically we had to, you know, we got videoed and whatever, and, you know, we had to watch ourselves back and it was really horrifying because I hate listening to myself. I hate seeing myself on camera. But anyway, that was kind of the first experience. And then moving on to us sort of opening the trauma board and the trauma center. And um, before we opened the board, we did a couple of sims. Now they really were low fidelity. It was a couple of us in a room um, with a dummy or somebody pretending to be a patient. Um, but it was the debrief afterwards. It was all the sort of technical things like, hang on a second, how are we actually going to get this patient down to theater? Where, where are the lifts? Because we were in a completely new building um, and there's all kinds of different lifts there's lift number three, lift number 23 or whatever. So um, it was all those processes that had to be ironed out. Where's the crash trolley? Where does it stay on the board? And um, little things like that. Um, and then I suppose we've kind of developed that onwards kind of organically. We've had um, sims with ICU teams and with our ED colleagues um, and theatre as well. Uh, and one of the things that came out recently was we, I'm not sure if you guys have the Voicera system, um, but we were using that. It's kind of like a little beam me up Scotty thing instead of mobile phones because the um, networks are terrible in hospitals, especially in theatre. So, you know, one of the guys who was doing the sim was trying to call the critical care outreach team. So you speak into this little thing um, um, and it's meant to contact the person that you want and they said you know call critical care outreach and nobody came nobody answered and then it was only afterwards that we realized that the call sign was outreach team so it's all those little things that you know you can iron out all the teething problems um, and it's also good crack you know you, you meet people you build relationships with them you can have a bit of a laugh but you're also you know work hard play hard sort of mentality as well yeah, absolutely. Um, they have those voceras in the matter. Um, so Keith's probably familiar with them and uh, just using them last year. They're yeah, yeah, phenomenal, kind of transformed the way the trauma team leadership role kind of uh, went as well. Um, Keith, I might come to you with the next question. So we're taking another step back you know, wider lens again. So we started with those individuals in resource, then we went to kind of that institutional level, then taking another step back again and looking at the trauma system from a national level then. So he talks about what governance structures um, exist at that national level or even at local level and um, uh, relating to trauma. Yeah, so it's a good question. And in fact, it's a big body of work that we're, we're, we're undertaking at the moment to look at exactly how the system will be, will, will be governed. Um, individual facilities have well-established governance structures through, you know, clinical director, CEO, the acute hospital division, et cetera. And that, that won't change. So the trauma system won't be, 
responsible for what each facility does. What we'll be looking at do is governing the, the networked aspects itself. How does the communication and movement of patients throughout the system work? And there's a variety of ways in which that will happen. Um, we've kind of, we're, we're going through a potential suite of KPIs and we kind of started with 400 and we're trying to whittle them down to useful ones, some of which are included in the major trauma audit, some of which need to be developed. Um, again, looking at how well patients move throughout the system. So is there delay in getting a secondary transfer uh, from a trauma unit to the, to the major trauma center? Is there going to be a delay in repatriating patients to get them back to a rehab facility close to home? Um, how, do I, how do we identify uh, whether or not the system is working well in that regard? How we make sure that things are done safely? Um, how we, again, somebody mentioned earlier on, celebrating successes. So the governance system is not just about identifying fault, but it's identifying things that work well. It's identifying ways in which that can be communicated um, beyond the system to make sure that people kind of do retain some element of buy into it. Um, how, how to ensure that there is some ownership of the different components and make sure that it doesn't become uh, a very kind of MTC-centric process. I mean, I mean, very keen from the word go that the, the trauma system is not just about major trauma and it's certainly not just about major trauma centers that we want to look at you know yes there are a few very bad injuries and we can try and you know reduce disability and avoid death in those cases but there's a huge number of more minor injuries and how they're treated better so you guys will be very familiar with the, the the patient with the wrist fracture that you know know needs a quick pull but you're waiting for hours for an orthopedic surgeon to tell you what you know already and to have a patient sitting in the ED for ages waiting for a bed to then wait for a theater slot and how that can be done better. So how, how we identify those kind of other aspects of trauma care and ensure that they're, they're addressed as well, because they do, they mean a lot to the individual patients, but also there's a capacity to, 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 to get efficiencies, to create, to create space, to, to kind of create resources in an innovative fashion, not just, just kind of throw theater space, et cetera, at it. So that's all kind of part and parcel of what we're doing at the moment, but focusing, as I say, on governing the networked aspect of the systems, those kind of the spokes between the different facilities. So we've spoken about trauma units and about how you make sure trauma teams work well and how you get trauma centers up and running and then at the far end at rehab, but it's those bits in between. So that's really what we're focusing on at the moment. Yeah, brilliant. And Connor, um, I might ask you what, what what challenges do you see at that um at that sort of system level then? And uh, no challenges at all. More couldn't be easier. Walk in the park. Uh, no, look. Um, what challenges do I see? I'll say. So I, I guess what we need uh, we we need to have a flow of funding. Uh, and reassurance that the funding will come um, and that there's political will to have the funding come, um, which is key. Uh, and that uh, to, to have that happen, I think we need uh, to do a lot of work with our uh, patient representatives uh, and we need to tell their stories and they need to know uh, the value add that trauma networks brings to outcomes for their loved ones. <clears throat> uh, and I and I think um, there's there, there's a lot of work for uh, for us as leaders in trauma care delivery in delivering those stories to people who hear them, uh, i.e., primarily the funders, uh, because um, the funders are influenced by the politicians, and um, so I, I think that piece of work is challenging. And you know, things change. You know, COVID has impacted on our delivery of the major trauma system. Ukraine is now going to impact on our delivery of the major trauma center. There are always going to be competing demands uh, and that in the context of all the other slings and arrows that will be uh, in the system that will uh, call, will be competing for attention and for funding. Um, but, you know, there is set up funding required to deliver trauma, the trauma system. So if, if we're going to a trauma unit next year, they will expect a certain level of commitment, uh, financial, uh, to help enable them as a trauma unit. Uh, and Keith and I have had that experience throughout the last number of years. Uh, and we're never able to deliver what it is that they ask for, but we do deliver the things that are prioritized and have delivered uh, things that are prioritized. And we'll continue to do our best to advocate for that hospital and, uh, you know, uh, so that it can deliver something meaningful to the patients that sustain tra trauma that are brought in their, do in their doors. Yeah. Keith? 
Yeah, Connor makes a really good point about about the the necessity for funding and the necessity for political will. And while we often give out about politicians and about administrators, and um, there is political will for this to happen. This is one of the key um, programs, along with cancer and uh, women and children uh, within the HSE. Um, and and the the Department of Health have committed. It's been mentioned in the last two budgets. We've got funding for it. What's going to get challenging is it's kind of delivery time um, because to keep the politicians on side, you've got to deliver something for them. And up until this point, uh, we've been talking about we're going, what we're going to do. And while we always say we don't have enough and we'll all, and it's probably always true um, to keep the politicians and the funders on side, you do at some point need to start delivering things. And 2022 is the year where we're supposed to deliver major trauma centers. Um, which will support trauma units and will support the pre-hospital care environment, will feed patients to the rehab environment in a better way and all those different bits and pieces. Um, and, and that's kind of the challenge. You kind of mentioned some of the things about teamwork on a kind of a, 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 a micro, microcosm and within hospitals, but teamwork in a bigger in a bigger capacity is when I'm knocking on the door looking for more money from the Minister for Health and he's knocking on Deeper's door, you do at some stage need to deliver something. Um, and when we're under pressure and when we feel we're being asked to do more with less and when we think we'd like more stuff, it, it is important to remember that. And that, that's that's the squeeze for us that's coming from the other side is, OK, we've given you, I can tell you, I won't tell you a kind of an open forum, but we've got a, a significant commitment to a significant amount of money. And when I speak to Susan's colleagues, Duncan um, and Ken, who are kind of running the program up, up, up the north, uh, we've got quite a bit of cash. We've got a, quite a bit of resources coming and it, it will, the time will come when we have to deliver on it. Um, and that will be challenging because then people will be given out to us when we're putting the squeeze on others to do it. So it is important to remember that you do have to, to pay the piper sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Niall, I might just come to you with this as well. So, you know, from from your perspective, then having those kind of uh, strong governance structures, do you find that helps reduce conflict? Yeah, I, I think it does. Um, you know, strong, you know, say in, in a group in a farm, you know, early boundaries make good friends. And it, it, governance structures, uh, I think they bed in trust at an early stage because it basically it, governance and accountability are two sides of the same coin, you could argue. And if people can see that it's open and transparent and that, look, you know, mistakes happen and how mistakes are accounted for and it's, you know, is is it is the justice public if you know or is it swept under the carpet um if it's swept under the carpet of course there's always a concern that it's a web of favors that that's one group looking after themselves from an older organization before they moved in that they, they will always those concerns will always exist but i think it's again it's back to the communication piece if you've clear governance structures everyone knows the roles everyone knows the boundaries and everyone knows the accountability mechanisms that are associated with mistakes um and not to you know it's not to apportion blame it's so that you know the learning environment improves and that you maintain that what they talk in high performance teams about psychological safety that if if people feel that they can make mistakes and not be publicly i suppose publicly shamed if you will um, in a professional environment that they're more likely to be open about how they made mistakes and then you there's a communal learning then that okay yeah because you'll see patterns of mistakes and why they're happening and they can they often can come back to things like you know uh, illness medications we talk about these same things over and over again illness medication stress alcohol fatigue and eating these are all the things that influence high performance so when the governance structures are there and when that's created that kind of holistic support is is in place yeah i, th I think it can be very beneficial in terms of dealing with conflict brilliant um fergal we might come to you there's a particularly spicy question in that uh, Q&A that's just been sitting there for a while. Um, do you want to fire it to the panel? Yeah, uh, so the question really is, is about um, whether emergency medicine or emergency physicians should be doing thoracotomies. And it comes from Brian Flavin and he describes his experience of a decision that was made that that would be the case even though they had cardiothoracic surgery on site in the institution he worked in. Uh, so what's the panel feel about that? Connor, I'll let you fire away with that one. Okay, so I, I think uh, thoracotomy is a big deal. It's a huge commitment uh, for that patient uh, in terms of uh, the duration of time they're going to subsequently spend if they do survive it um, in hospital. It's a huge deal for the institution in terms of, uh, 
you know, that patient is going to spend a long time in that ICU. That patient is going to spend a lot of time getting, you know, in theatre and then getting rehabilitated thereafter. So it is certainly not something that in any way should be seen as uh, a rite of passage uh, for anybody. And it certainly can't become part of the ritual of death associated with trauma that we would do a thoracotomy on, on everybody. Uh, OK, but that said, there are indications for doing it. And we need to have people who are competent at number one, knowing the indications for doing it, and number two, delivering it. And it's never going to be, uh, you know, they're, they're, when I worked at the Alfred Major Trauma Centre in Melbourne, uh, uh, we went, we did a, we had pre-course learning, we then had uh, a half a day in an animal lab, uh, and, and, and we then had to do it with consultant, with our senior consultant supervision in advance of being let loose doing it on our own. And again, it just, you know, the, the way it appears on algorithms. Uh, so for example, it's on the European Resuscitation Council algorithm for the traumatic cardiac arrest. It sits there as if it's a, you know, it, it sits there. And I don't think the way it sits on the algorithm, algorithm reflects how big a decision it is to make it. And Niall discussed earlier on how they ring a friend or, or ring a colleague about a flight plan before they actually put the helicopter in the air. And I think that, you know, we need to be careful about the patients that we choose uh, to do a thoracotomy on. We need to be competent if we are doing it. Uh, and so that requires ongoing training. And it's the sort of thing where you would need to go back into the sim lab and repeat at six or 12 month intervals so that you retain your competencies. And, um, and, and I think we need to give it the due respect. And certainly we need to give the cardiothoracic surgeons who will be picking up the pieces afterwards, the comfort to know that we are taking, that, that we have given it the due respect and that we develop our thoracotomy um, pathways in collaboration with them because at the end of the day they and uh, therapists and so on will will be dealt will, will have to deal with the consequences they'll have to you know they will be managing that patient after the patient gets admitted to the hospital for weeks and months thereafter uh, so we need to be absolutely bulletproof in our decision making uh, around thoracotomy and in our training and our credentialing of people to do thoracotomy yeah Ms. Young. Um, I think that the decision, as Connor said, I think the decision making um, in thoracotomy is probably harder than um, the actual technical aspect itself. And I absolutely agree that um, emergency medicine physicians should be doing this procedure. Um, in our institution, our cardiothoracic surgeons are on call from home. So, I mean, they could be 25 minutes away. In these kind of situations, you don't have that time. You've got minutes, perhaps even seconds to make that decision. If you're going to phone them and get them in from home, it's too late. Um, so, whilst I wouldn't say put a label on it as to which specialty should do it, I think whoever's appropriately trained, so some of us as general surgeons will do it in our institution, um, cardiothoracic surgeons if it's during the day they'll come down, but if there's a, you know, if there's an emergency medicine consultant there or a senior reg or whatever, if they're trained to do it, then absolutely they should do that procedure um, to save that patient's life. And it's things like, um, you know, simulation, as you've mentioned, we, our ED guys recently ran a um, resuscitative thoracotomy simulation and there was so much learning that came out of that you know it's like well let's take the patient to theatre okay who's going to phone do you know how to use the finish editor retractor do you know how to put it together all those little things that kind of add up together and then it's like you know courses as you've mentioned so um definitive surgical trauma skills and um, resuscitative thoracotomy is one of the procedures that um we teach on that um and it is relevant relevant for emergency medicine um trainees or um, consultants who can come on the course as observers to see what's involved and you know get to be familiar with the decision making for um thor resuscitative thoracotomy Brilliant. Yeah, um, absolutely. I'll come to you um, next, Dr. Quinn. Um, and I suppose specifically want to ask you as well about um, not just the thoracotomies, but with other like high acuity, low occurrence um, procedures like that, how much time should we be dedicating to learning about them and thinking about them? Because, you know, as, as I said, they're fairly low occurrence. Um, absolutely. I kind of get told this all the time. Oh, we don't need to bother about trauma because our numbers um, are so low. Um, and I, I know our numbers are very low. Um, and Connor will be able to sort of tell uh, the stats between, you know, one and five percent of the overall um, numbers of trauma in Ireland. 
But I still believe um, that we should be as well trained and competent and able to perform those procedures as somebody that sees them every single day. And I'm really, really passionate about that. Um, I've, you know, it's been difficult at times to introduce these things because, as I said, they are so infrequent. But infrequent. But the difficulty with with paediatric trauma is, and it's different to adult trauma. In that adult trauma, you're probably seeing them every single shift. In paediatric trauma, we might not get a case for four months, and then we might get three um, within the space of two days. Um, and I mean, I've kind of said this before that that with peds, there is a huge um, emotive element um, from the parents, from the staff. But part of that emotive element is the um, it, it's almost a, a dogmatic inability to perform invasive procedures in kids. And the invasive procedures are the life saving ones. Um, like Connor in Melbourne, we did cadaver courses and we went to the live animal lab and we trained and learned how to do it. And I think there is definitely something to be said for that six monthly review of, as it's Susan said, um, use of the retractor, being able to put it together, the decision making process. So whilst our numbers are, are really low, I think that we need to even place more importance on them because of our um, low numbers. Paediatric stabbings are on the rise. And again, I remember whenever I came back and I was introducing this idea of resuscitative thoracotomy and, and all these courses that we'd done in Melbourne and our credentialing process that we had in place. But we've had three stabbings from the East Wall in the past two months. And I think, you know, at the moment, while we're kind of almost in inverted commas getting away with not having to think about resuscitative thoracotomy because they've responded to things like thoracostomy and they've responded to chest strains. I worry that the time is going to come very soon when we're um, not going to miss a life-saving procedure, but because of our lack of training and our lack of consideration, which is primarily due to the low numbers, that we're not going to be able to perform a life-saving procedure on somebody in whom it's absolutely indicated. Um, that's always been my concern. I think that's given everyone some um, some very serious food for thought and maybe something that we can um, think about taking further and probably and more um, um, uh, officially forward in, in emergency medicine training in terms of, of how we um, we prepare our trainees for, for these kind of procedures. Um, we just in the interest of time, we've got less than 10 minutes left. Um, so what we'd like to do is, is end on a, on a happy note. And so let's get some hopeful messages perhaps. And so I'm gonna ask each of you, um, looking your head, what's your biggest wish for trauma care in the next five to 10 years? So we'll just go with um, the whoever's on, on screen in no particular order. And Connor, do you see you're up first? Look, I think we're on a journey. Now I'd love the journey to be going, you know, us to be going at a faster rate, but my biggest wish is that we deliver upon the, the 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 journey that we've we've embarked on, which is the delivery of two trauma networks, and that we see the the associated improvement in patient outcomes, and not just mortality, because that's a really crude outcome measure. What we want to see is people getting back to independent living, people getting back to work, uh, people, uh, um, and 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 the system acknowledging trauma is, is big for me in terms of it. Uh, and, and we've we've achieved that to you know and that is now government policy but you know that that the system acknowledges how, how difficult and chaotic and undifferentiated and across all time zones and so on trauma care delivery comes in at and and provides support to those of us who are involved in its delivery so that we can continue to do it in a sustainable resilient way okay Niall Buckley I think I suppose really this isn't one that I'm, um, I'm probably best placed to talk about trauma. The only thing I will say in a more comedic um, aspect, I'm looking at more here, um, is that there is significant uh, trauma in West Cork every time Cork footballers go out and get beaten every summer. So anything that we can do to improve that will will certainly um, will aid in, in our trauma issues in West Cork during the summer months. I think Thanks that's an that. excellent um, addition to this discussion. I arrived, I Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Susan Young. Um, my wish would be that we could continue to build on the phenomenal work that's already been done across all our networks and um, to try and develop, you know, a world class trauma system so that, you know, God forbid, if anything happens to any of our family and friends, that we could be sure that they could get the best care possible. And Keith Sinnott. Uh, I hope that we build on fostering the idea that trauma care is 
a team endeavor and that people work together and think about the bigger picture because that cuts across everything. It cuts across what happens in the resource room, what happens across the network, what happens across the across the country, what happens beyond trauma actually into other in issues and diseases. And the people just have that simple sense to work together. I had an experience where a patient had a very bad outcome and the doctor who's responsible for, for looking after them said to me, Jay, if only I had your phone number, that would have made a difference because then I would have been able to phone a friend and had a team member to help. And that's really all that we need. We don't need others, other, we don't need fancy equipment or anything else. We just need to work together towards it. So that sounds like kind of bullshit, but actually I think if we all work together, we will get this sorted out. That's my hope. Definitely, definitely nothing um, um, bullshit about that. I think we might have to edit these words for the for the release. Um, um, Nuala Quinn, please. Um, I suppose my vision and wish um, for the future is to work with the trauma system with Keith Sinnott and with the, the clinical leads for the South and the Central Network. But I want to be able to provide a standardised system of paediatric trauma care that provides the same level of trauma reception and resuscitation um, across hospitals, primarily the trauma units and the major trauma centre in Ireland. I want to be able to develop a local training package like the one that we provide in Temple Street that extends nationally so that trauma units um, feel part of the system and that they're not alien or isolated to the new children's hospital. Um, I would really love um, to develop progressive technology to be able to link the children's hospital to the proposed TUs. So things like mobile immersive suites and the trauma team training that we bring out. Um, and lastly, in that vein, I, I would love to be able to develop video technology to link the trauma units directly to the trauma team in the new children's hospital. So say, for example, a video link where the trauma team leader in a trauma unit can dial in um, to the trauma team who could the trauma team leader could watch the recess and provide help if requested um, provide support um, and then things like a timely transfer would be smooth and not a challenge um, for the patient or the team. No, I kind of thought before the pandemic that this might be a pipe dream, it might be unachievable, but I think the pandemic has shown us that video communication is actually feasible and the potential is, is huge. Um, and as I've said before, I mean, the small number of kids means that it's really important that we link all the hospitals and staff, that we provide um, good communication, that we develop the network of paediatric trauma care and be able to improve the care that we provide. And exactly as Susan said, so that if one of our loved ones, if our friends or our family come in, that we're confident that we're able to provide the best um, trauma and resuscitation care that is is worthy of, of worldwide recognition. Yeah, I think I think everyone on this on this discussion would would agree with you. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left, so we might put that question to uh, to Mr. Fergal Hickey, our moderator, perhaps. Yeah, I suppose um, when when I um, started agitating about this some years ago, and we obviously produced a position paper that that Common TC uh, wrote most of us. I mean, we were I suppose gratified to see that the national plan, the, the the trauma system for Ireland, leaned very heavily on it. So I think we've always felt that we've been a significant driver of this journey. But I would be very keen to see what Nula has described, uh, applied to both adults and children. So irrespective of where you access the system, that the standard of care you receive is the same. Uh, and we know it currently isn't. And we know that, you know, you still typically tend to get brought to the local, local department, whether that has or hasn't uh, facilities out of ours. That, thankfully, in the last couple of years has changed and fit with trauma bypass. But we need to do a lot more work to standardize the system. I think we're on a journey. I mean, I, I don't think the journey will take as long as people are concerned about, because even if even if the facilities aren't brought up to uh, an internationally acceptable standard, uh, as long as people are working together and actually have, are part of integrated teams, then is this possible to deliver better trauma care, even in arguably poor, infrastructurally poor environments? I think. That would be a big step forward. And I think that would be rewarded yeah. by political support and financial support. 
not saying that we should do everything in advance of getting money, but what I'm saying is that I think that the evidence will support the need to give further financing. And I think it will be self-fulfilling. And, I, and I, I, I see this, I see a significant improvement likely in the next five years. Brilliant. Excellent. That's um, that's a great way to wrap it up, guys. Uh, thank you so much for a fantastic discussion. Um, like I, like I said at the start, it was absolutely thrilling and um, it was absolutely fantastic having um, everyone um, on board. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Nuala Quinn, Ms. Susan Young, uh, Professor Connor DC, Lieutenant Colonel Niall Buckley, and Mr. Keith Sinnott for joining us. And thanks, uh, Connor and Fergal, for helping us put this together. And thanks uh, to Claire Bryant um, for all uh, the help behind the scenes as well and her moral support today um so thank you all for joining us and thanks everyone for tuning in um and uh make sure to uh, subscribe and uh, listen to the case dot report and um we'll see you on the next episode thank you well done mo well done orla thanks everyone thanks guys <laughs>